Hello everyone. Today I'm going to share some really unique and extinct drums with you. These are the PV. That's right, I said PV, the same company that makes loudspeakers and amps and PA systems and some microphones and other things. Nothing really expensive. Uh, they made drums. So these are the radial drums from the 1990s. And I believe they made these until about 2002 or so. And I remember walking into a music store and seeing these and thinking, what the hell is that? <laughs> They're not extremely attractive, not bad. This finish is pretty nice. I saw some red ones as well that had a nice gloss finish. This is just a natural maple finish. But I was intrigued by them. I'd never seen anything like it. And when I played them, I was amazed at how great they sounded. I had a friend who worked at this store called McFadden Music. They're now extinct, just like the drums. And, uh, you know, normally I don't go into music stores. Actually, I haven't been in one in years and years. But back then, I just needed to pick up something. And I saw these there, and, and there was no one in the store. So he said, yeah, go ahead and play them. So I played them for a while. And uh, like I said, I was just really amazed how great they sounded. They rang. Uh, the ring on them was, was very extensive, really full-bodied sound. They just had a different kind of sound, but they were extremely expensive. I remember I asked how much they were, and I was shocked. In, in the upper $1,000, I believe the kit that I saw, which was a six-piece kit, which was a red kit, was about $5,000. So that at that time, I didn't have... Um, a lot of money so that was not going to happen so I forgot all about them and then um, I was doing a session a couple of years ago and a guy brought these in not this particular kit but a kit and it wasn't even this model it was a lower model I think they were the 500 series and we mic'd them up and boy they sounded great and so I thought you know if I ever have the opportunity to get a kit I'm gonna do it and I did find a kit eventually and this is that kit, and it has a 10-inch, a 12-inch, a 14, and a 16-inch tom, and a 22-inch bass drum. So later on in this video, I'll set all those up, and I'll play them for you so you can hear them with my normal, minimal three-mic uh, setup that I use, so you can really hear what they sound like in the room. Meanwhile, let's, let's talk a little about the drums and the design, which uh, I can really relate to. Since I studied with a timpanist, Fred Hanger, in college, who designed some timpani using the same concept. So in other words, this shell, which on the toms is about a tenth of an inch, very thin, it's a three-ply shell. This shell is floating. There's no hardware on it whatsoever. This rims mount, which I don't even think you would need, so I'm not sure why there's a rims mount. I guess it was just a selling point. Uh, by the way, if I didn't say it already, the guy who invented these was Stephen Volpp, I think you say. It's V-O-L-P-P. -P. I could have the pronunciation wrong. But, um, you know, I don't know if, if it was his idea or uh, PV's idea to put these rim mounts on there. But you would think it wouldn't really need them. They needed some kind of mount because obviously there's no hardware on them. But I think this is a little bit overkill. And it's not actually even suspended Really, you know, normally the rims mounts will move around. So, but uh, but the drums still sound great. Now I took the top head off, and in a minute I'm going to give you a tour of the inside. Actually, I can probably do it right here without moving the camera, so you can see how thick these upper rims are. It's kind of it's plywood. They're maple. It's blocked together, so plywood is glued, and they're pretty heavy. You know, they're not massively heavy like sonars, but they're pretty heavy. So the concept was to get rid of any kind of hardware, have that shell float in there. So my teacher, Fred Hinger, had timpani where you could uh, revolve the drums to change the beating spot. Because what would happen with calf heads is they would wear out. They're so expensive and hard to tuck that once you wore out a certain beating spot, you can rotate the drum a little and have a new beating spot. So literally that calf head could last you years and years and years. So that was the concept, and he made uh, the, the Hanger Touchtone Company 
made those timpani for many years, and lots of orchestras use them. The orchestra um, Amen used them for many years, and they were great drums. They're, they're hard to come by now. Uh, very, very heavy, you know, just like all the symphonic timpani, they're extremely heavy. But there was no hardware on the shell. The shell just dropped right into this basket, and you could revolve it. And several other timpani use this method now, too. But back in those days, not as much. And, of course, if you ever see a Ludwig timpani or, a, you know, a Yamaha, all those, they have the um, hardware on them. So, uh, so the goal is to let that drum open up. It has more volume, has more ring, has a deeper sound, deeper fundamental tone. And that's what you get with these. Uh, so it's a great concept. I don't know why it didn't catch on, but I think maybe two reasons. First of all, they say PV on there, and I have nothing against PV, but you know, back in the day when you had Yamaha and Pearl and DW was uh, kind of, you know, making some real boutique drum sets and obviously Tama, um, Tama, however you want to say it. And, you know, those drum sets had a certain look to them. And then this comes along. It looks like a little bit of a flying saucer. <laughs> and uh, and so they didn't catch on and they were very, very expensive. So uh, they were discontinued, I believe, in 2002, like I said. Now, you could tell the age of these by the um, badge here. So if the badge is screwed on like that, not, not uh, stuck on, but screwed on, then you know it's pre-1997. I believe starting 1997 or so, they started using a stick-on badge. Also, the early badges have patent pending, um, and the later badges, the patent was approved in the United States, and some even say Australia that I've seen, which is kind of weird. But anyway, so uh, this is an early kit. I would believe, I believe this is probably uh, 1994 19, through 1996, somewhere around there. And if you can get a set of these, try to get the early ones. I have played some of the later ones, and I feel like the, the materials maybe got a little bit... Um, well, let's just say skimpy. <laughs> uh, I checked out some of them. I almost bought a kit, but the drums didn't seem as heavy. Uh, I believe some of these, the really, really early ones, were turned on a lathe, these collars here. Uh, but later on, they might have just blocked them together, glued them together, in other words. And there is probably some information on these on the Internet, but not too many people own them. And... Um, you know, so I'm, I don't know how much you'll be able to find out. But that's what I know about them. And today, what we're going to do, they need new heads. So I took this head off to show you the inside. And I think this will do. I don't have to take the camera off. You can just get a quick look at this. And you see how that is. Now, if you buy cases, you have to remember to buy... The, a case that's a size bigger. So for this 10 inch, you need a 12 inch case. The bass drum for this kit is 22, so you need a 24 inch case. So the cases need to be big because of the extended size of these hoops here, the wooden hoops, and of course the rims mount. So make sure you do that if you buy some. And I would definitely suggest if you're gigging with these to get hard cases, okay? Because the shells are very, very thin. I don't think they're fragile, but uh, but, the, you know, if you dropped it off of a card or something, you might have some problems because of the really, really thin shells. All right, so what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, before, actually, let me just show you how this works. Oops. I'm going to take these, uh, these lugs off so you can, well, I should say tension rods off, so you can see this. And we'll use, we'll do it fast. I'll just show you how it sits on there. Now you notice these tension rods are really short. So, like that. 
and you can get replacements or you can cut one down. It's not a big deal. Something happens. All right, normal rim. No, not die cast or anything. Just a regular old cheap rim. I thought about uh, getting some different die cast rims for these, but they sound so good, I wouldn't want to mess that up. But I may experiment with that at some point just for fun. Uh, or, you know, you can get some gold rims. That would look pretty cool, I guess. Anyway. All right. So this is what it looks like. You have these inserts here. And that's all it does. It's very, very simple. I'm not sure why they were so expensive. Seems pretty easy. I'm sure someone could make these. Again, very easily. But there's probably... Obviously, there's a patent on them. So, so hopefully you can see all that. That's it. It's pretty much, you know, like a big salad bowl, okay? And you see the rim here. This is pretty cool. Bearing edges are nice. They're sharp, very thin. That probably has a lot to do with the ring, too. Reminds me a little of, of the Zelkova, the Canopus. Zelkova, very sharp. Now, there's a little bit of a, and this one's got a little bit of a nick in there. It doesn't really, I could sand it out, but I'm not sure when that happened. But like the Zelkova, the Canopus Zelkovas, they're extremely sharp, and I love that sound. It gives you a real punchy sound. But like I said, for being almost 30 years old, they're in really good shape. All right, so I'll put heads on these, and we'll set them up, and I'll play them for you, and we'll see how they sound. So before we go on, I just wanted to show you this bass drum. The bass drum for this kit sounds really, really good. And... Um, just wanted to show you the inside of the shell because I am changing the head. A little bit of dust there I'll get off, but solid, you know, it's thicker. This is a five ply. And the um, the toms are a three ply. It's got a little rest there where it rests on the ground, which is clever. So there's a tilt to it. And then the um, the spurs here changed as time went on. I believe they came, became a little more lightweight. These clamp to the rim, so you can move those. And they're just standard spurs here, but the, the later ones were a little bit lighter, is what I've heard, I've not seen them. Same bearing edge though, super sharp. All right, so it's the next day, I had to uh, set these up and then I had to go to a gig. So I put pinstripes on the toms, clear pinstripes on all of them and on the bottom I put clear diplomats except for this lowest tom I didn't have a 16 inch diplomat on me and so I put an ambassador and you'd be surprised at what a big difference the bottom heads make especially on these drums so I went with the thinnest head possible it's not a snare diplomat it's not that thin it's just a thinner head than a batter ambassador so that's the diplomat. And then uh, I don't have the matching snare for these drums, so I just uh, happen to have a matching finish Tama Star Classic from the 90s as well. It's a great sounding drum. So uh, I'm playing that with this kit. The only reason being that it, it matches them in color. <laughs> All right, so uh, these drums are definitely the loudest, punchiest, drums I have ever played on. And the bass drum is pretty incredible. So you see that punch, and microphone-wise, I'm only using a mic over my head like I always do. It's this AKG C24, and on the kick, I am using a Beta 52, which is a cheap dynamic mic, right outside of the bass drum. It's not even inside the bass drum. I tried that. It actually overwhelmed that mic. That's how powerful this drum is. Now, while setting these up, it was kind of a pain in the neck because you have these rings here. And they uh, sort of 
don't allow you to put the drums super close. So you have to kind of play a game where you're stacking the rims, uh, the wooden rims, on top of each other. Here it's fine. Here down below with these big, uh, the, the uh, 14 and the 16, which really with the rings resemble a 16 and an 18, you have to do a little bit of maneuvering. So this would not be a kit I would gig with regularly where I have to, you know, carry them around, first of all, because they're big, big cases and everything. And then I'd have to set them up and spend a while getting them where I like them. So this probably took me twice as long. But for a studio kit, there would be outstanding. Something that you could leave, you know, set up uh, if you have a room for recording or just practicing or even teaching. Um, I plan to set these drums up in a room for recording. Uh, just a lot of the rock stuff that I do for people. Uh, a lot of it is over the internet. You know, they'll send me tracks and I'll send them back. These drums would be perfect for that. But I will not be gigging at all with these drums. It's just, you know, going to be too, too, much, uh, too much stress on my old body. Uh, now, they're not heavy. They're just big. So uh, they have a large size. And they're a little, like I said, hard to maneuver. As far as cymbals go, I'm just using these Peisties and the regular Sabian uh, Dijonette ride I always use. Oh, and, and hi-hats. I have this pair of uh, Artisan Vault Sabian cymbals that, that are nice. So that's what I'm going to be using today for this demo. Uh, the bass drum beater is felt, not even uh, the hard plastic I normally use, because again, that was a little bit overwhelming. So the bass drum really, to me, is the best sounding drum on this kit, although they all sound really good. So I'll just play a little for you. I'll try to use the toms a lot. I'm not going to do anything too fancy just so you can get an idea of what they sound like in the room without them being individually mic'd.
<laughs> I'm used to playing on, on a small kit, as you know, and it's a lot of work to play on bigger drums. It's probably good practice physically to do that. But they do suck you in, especially these large toms. Now here, uh, for me acoustically in the room, these large drums almost resemble timpani. They're so big sounding. have a huge thunderous sound. So these are the PV Radio 1000s. I totally recommend them if you could find a set. They're extremely unique. The look of them is kind of like Jabba the Hutt <laughs> with this giant bass drum and these small toms and you know, it's got this big big belly. But if you can get past that, um, you know, they're actually kind of beautiful. The way they're designed, they sound great. So uh, I don't know if you'll be able to find a set, but they really are a unique sounding drum kit. So I hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you next time.